think uh, what I'll do is primarily focus on uh, a couple of ocular uh, uh, conditions. One is retinoblastoma and the other is uh, uh, retinal uh, degenerations and I know Sharola is going to be talking about labor congenital amorosis and that she will cover certain aspects but I'll go over uh, uh, some of the things uh, relevant to retinal degenerations as well and maybe uh, just a word about congenital cataract if there's time. So this uh, first slide just gives a, a, a kind of a schematic about uh, why we look at genetics of eye diseases. I think this has already been brought out uh, amply, you know, in, in uh, by both Jerry and, and uh, Anthony Sundaresan as well, uh, because and in terms of illustrations, uh, they actually showed you uh, cases and anecdotes and so on. But this just gives you a broad scheme. So uh, what we do is we uh, do genetic screening, which has of necessity become very high throughput uh, because of the volume of screening or number of genes and so on that you have to test in a lot of these conditions. Uh, and that's uh, basically what we mean when we say genomics. Uh, then this is used either, it can be used for diagnosis and counseling of patients. Uh, you can actually use genetic uh, data or genotype data to derive correlations with the phenotype or the, or the, uh, or the range of clinical manifestations that a patient has for a given disease. Uh, and that if you have correlations that you can develop through such uh, uh, means, you can use that actually maybe to prognosticate uh, for a particular patient. And that's the idea. Uh, you can do what's called as functional genomics. Now this is more of interest to a research scientist like me where you can actually maybe try to look at the function of this particular gene and how this mutation is affecting its function. And this is a more long-term uh, goal because then you try to, you, it'll give you some clues about the pathogenesis or the mechanism of disease and that will give you some new ideas about the disease itself and the pathway to the disease. And that in turn maybe can help you to develop a new therapy. And then you can actually look at therapy in terms of gene therapy, uh, which co it could be conventional or gene therapy. Yeah, so I'll just talk about retinoblastoma here. And uh, I think uh, many people don't need this introduction, but uh, it's a malignancy of the retinal precursor cells. And you can have inactivation of the RB1 gene uh, on chromosome 13 uh, by mutation. So you have hereditary as well as non-hereditary forms of retinoblastoma. And usually it's inherited as an autosomal dominant disorder with very high penetrance. Um, and both the alleles of this gene need to be inactivated, however, for development of malignancy. So there is a model that is, uh, that is used, uh, that's well known, that's used to describe this particular condition and the way in which it develops, uh, which is called the two-hit hypothesis given by Knudsen many years ago. Uh, then RB1 gene is actually a tumor, sub tumor, tumor suppressor gene which regulates the cell division cycle and, and thereby when you actually end up inactivating it through mutation, you can have a uh, development of uh, tumor. So this is uh, nothing but the two-hit hypothesis uh, which has been given for, uh, for development of uh, cancer and it applies to uh, many other genes as well by now. So you have mutation of the first copy or the first allele of the gene as we say and this is transmitted through the germline that is it means it's present in all the cells of the body. Uh, it gives the patient a predisposition to a tumor that is it makes them prone to develop the tumor. But what happens is that you need a mutation of the second copy as well and this happens somatically, that is it happens in the retina and that gives rise to hereditary disease. So you have uh, this kind of scheme giving rise to hereditary form of RB. On the other hand, if you have mutations of the first as well as the second allele both in the retina itself, uh, uh, that is we say somatic mutation, then you have non-hereditary disease. Yeah, so this is just a comparison now. How does, how do they differ? Obviously, hereditary retinoblastoma is mostly bilateral. It can be unilateral in some cases. Early onset, you have a higher risk of second malignancy because these patients have that mutation which, which confers a risk of malignancy. It's mostly sporadic, which means it occurs in uh, single patients with no family history and about 5% of cases are familial. So they actually have affected relatives. And non-hereditary, of course, is entirely unilateral. Uh, it has a later onset relatively than the bilateral cases and the hereditary cases. There's uh, really not much of uh, or hardly any risk of a second malignancy uh, uh, developing. And you have it, it being entirely sporadic, which means no familial occurrence. And the ratio of bi to unilateral is 40 to 60. And 10 to 12 percent of unilateral retinoblastoma has been noted to be hereditary. And... Uh, so what I have here is just to show you the kinds of pedigrees, the kinds of families that you have with retinoblastoma. So I'm, I'm showing you here a, a case where you can have a, a, what's called as low penetrance or incomplete penetrance. 
and we, what we mean by this is that you can have people who are carrying the mutation, carrying the RB1 gene mutation, but who do not develop the disease. So we call these uh, kinds of, when we see this pattern, we say it uh, has decreased, reduced penetrance or uh, incomplete penetrance. So here you can see now the shaded uh, symbols are people who are affected. And here you can obviously see that from the previous generation, this gene has been carried through this person to the subsequent generation because the two children having the disease, but this father himself is not affected. And uh, he, uh, he is obviously the mutation carrier here in this family, but uh, this is a case of uh, reduced penetrance because he doesn't manifest the disease. So this is what we mean. And this is an actual pedigree of a family with retinoblastoma. And the, the half-shaded symbols are actually unilaterally affected people. So you can see that there's a variability in the expression of disease. You can have bilateral, you can have unilateral in the same family. Uh, and you have a case where there is non-penetrance because you have a, 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 a parent who is normal. Uh, uh, who is actually transmitting the gene to a child who is affected and so on here. You again have a normal parent and an affected child. Again here it's unilateral. So this is the kind of family history you may see uh, in the familial ret retinoblastoma and here are some other pedigree patterns that we come across in the patients that we have analyzed genetically. You can have a parents who are totally not affected and two of the children being affected, two or more children. And this clearly is a situation where uh, you know if two or more children are aff affected, it's coming down through the germline. But we say that it is actually uh, what's co called as mosaicism, which means that the parent is a mosaic. That is, he or she has certain cells carrying the mutation and some other cells not carrying the mutation. So this is what happens with this mosaicism in the germline. So some of the germlines have the mutation, some of the germ cells don't have it. And you have this kind of pattern and you have entirely uh, single cases, single children being affected. So here you can have mosaicism in the germline or you can have what's called as a postzygotic uh, mutation. And what do you do in terms of genetic analysis and uh, counseling in retinoblastoma? Uh, you can actually give uh, you, there are certain general risks regardless of genetic testing. Uh, in, in a patient with, for example, bilateral retinoblastoma, which is familial, because it's autosomal dominant, you have 50% risk in the offspring and, and uh, the siblings of the patient will have also 50% risk. If it's unilateral, you can have 10 to 50%. Again, it depends. It's because 10% of unilateral retinoblastoma is hereditary. Uh, in non-familial cases, the risk is, again, because bilateral RB is usually, uh, uh, you know, caused by a new germline mutation, you have a 50% risk for the offspring of the patient. And for siblings, uh, if it's non-familial, it can be up to about 5%. And for unilateral RB, it's a risk of 1%, which is minimal risk, uh, because generally speaking, it's not uh, hereditary. So basically, this is just, uh, you know, a strategy for genetic analysis. Now, a lot of times, it tends to be really involved. So it tends to be really involved in the large number of tests, large number of genes to be screened. So I think that uh, what what really happens is that uh, one has to really weigh. I mean, for example, if you want a genetic test, then why would you want to do it? I mean, that's a kind of an important uh, question. And what is it going to tell you? So it's actually the purpose is as accurate risk assessment, cost versus benefit is important. And does it help you to change, you know, in terms of surveillance and management, is it going to alter anything for the patient? And, uh, for example, in the case of retinoblastoma, you can avoid unnecessary examinations if you know that that patient is not a carrier or the family member is not a carrier. So this is just to show you that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis has been done for retinoblastoma years ago. This was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And uh, this is the uh, organization to show you the RB1 gene, and there's an S phase D located right next to it. Uh, which has been used as a marker in the old days when we didn't know about the retinoblastoma gene. And you have all kinds of mutations in the RB1 gene, uh, which range from very large deletions encompassing almost the whole gene or a big part of it. You can have small mutations that, that affect single bases. Uh, you can have other kinds of mutations such as epigenetic mutations. And uh, this is just to show you that different methods are involved. Like, for example, you can have uh, chromosome level changes, you can have large changes uh, involving a big part of the gene. So you need different techniques depending on all these. So actually, a complete genetic test for RB would cover different techniques that will, uh, you know, look at these different kinds of changes. And uh, this I'm just going to run over. Actually, I'm not going to go into detail because it's there in the handout. But this is just to show you when we actually did a study on a good number of retinoblastoma patients. And we had a multi-step approach to look at deletions and small changes and, and, uh, and you know, different kinds of changes. And uh, what we found was we had uh, all different kinds of mutations. 
we had patients who had the very large deletions uh, we had patients who had much smaller deletions so you know we had like uh, uh, different kinds of mutations represented in this patient population and we were able to in the bilateral cases bilateral along with familial together identify mutations in about 80 percent so uh, i think it's reasonably good but it could also be like a little bit higher than this uh, so there are always chances when you do genetic testing that you miss out the mutation and a negative result is uh, you know has to be taken with a pinch of salt you have to be very careful because obviously in this case you are not going to uh, if, you know you have to just say that okay it's not telling you anything at all but it doesn't mean uh, you know that there's no mutation as such you know it, it's just that maybe it hasn't been found maybe it's located on an unusual site and so it's been missed so i mean just a word about retinal dystrophies here uh, this is just to show you the number of genes over a period of time you can see here after jan 2012 there's like well over 200 genes known and this tells you about how uh, complex it is genetically speaking uh, you have different subtypes of retinal dystrophies uh, you know rod cone cone rod and so on and the generalized photoreceptor dystrophies uh, you can have syndromic and non syndromic and you have genetic testing being used for the kinds of purposes that were already mentioned in the beginning uh, for retinal dystrophies and i just want to tell you about the dna chips which people have mentioned so basically this is what uh, a picture showing a chip so what it has it, ha it has little pieces of uh, short segments of dna being spotted at several locations and you can run your sample over it and it will pick up a mutation uh, depending on what kinds of mutations this chip is designed to detect so it's kind of cost effective if you especially have to test large number of genes like in these cases like for rp and those kinds of diseases and this is just some examples of chips that have been used that have been developed and this is again by asper ophthalmics which has been mentioned by sundaresan and, and um, anthony uh, so they have chips for lca for example where you have more than 300 known mutations and they will screen the chip can screen for all these so if a patient has one of these you can actually get a positive result and uh, so on then you have other arrays that have been used uh, for uh, different retinal diseases and i think for especially retinal dystrophies these are useful because you can actually screen uh, multiple genes at the same time otherwise it would take us months and years to get at the mutation so and this is about the whole genome sequencing i think people have mentioned the 1000 dollar genome uh, so the idea is to screen the entire genome uh, at a stretch for a patient and it has been used to derive what's called as personalized genomes or personal genome sequences i mean that's the idea of doing uh, this in some of the cases but i think as it becomes cheaper right now it's not but as it becomes cheaper it would probably be a good alternative for diseases like retinal degenerations uh, because you have too many genes you have too large a ground to cover so this would certainly be of help uh, to to pinpoint the genetic uh, mutation and nowadays patients have started asking because they know i think charola is going to talk more about lca and stuff but uh, you know people want to know and uh, and i think i'll just stop there because uh, i'm not going to going to cataract i i just had a little bit to say but i'll just stop uh, and and instead if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer